Good evening, everyone. My name is Bonnie, and I would like to welcome you to our From Shore to Sea Lecture Series, sponsored by Channel Islands National Park. The purpose of this series is to further the understanding of research on the Channel Islands and surrounding waters. The lectures are held on the second Thursday of each month, January through December, at the Channel Islands National Park Robert J. Ligo Marcino Visitor Center. Each lecture is recorded and is available soon afterwards on the park website. The restrooms and drinking fountain are located outside and to the right. Parking lots should not be locked until 9 p.m. If a locked gate is encountered on the visitor center side of the harbor, there are signs that will direct you to a night exit. For the December From Shore to Sea lecture, guest, spe guest speaker Justin Wilkins is unable to attend to present his lecture, Santa Rosa Island Mammoth Discovery. The lecture on December 14th instead will be a special presentation on the Island of the Blue Dolphins, including new research results and information sources on the Lone Woman of San Nicolas Island. During the Q&A portion following tonight's lecture, please wait for me to bring the microphone to you before asking your question. This ensures our virtual audience can hear the questions being asked. Tonight, we are delighted to have Dr. Peter Sharp as our guest lecturer. He will discuss the remarkable recovery of peregrine falcons on the Channel Islands. Today, there are over 50 resident peregrine pairs, well in excess of the peregrine population in 1955 when they disappeared from the islands. Working for the Institute of Wildlife Studies, Sharp has directed peregrine falcon monitoring and the bald eagle restoration program on the Channel Islands since 1997. Additionally, Sharp has taken part in the research and management of other species, including the island fox, golden eagle, osprey, and loggerhead shrike. Sharp received his PhD in zoology from Colorado State University in 1998. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Sharp. Thanks for coming out this evening. Um, so today I'd like to tell you a bit about the history of the peregrine falcons on the Channel Islands and in North America in general and uh, causes of their declines, what was done to bring them back, and then the research that we've been conducting for the last five years um, out on the islands. So the peregrine falcon, just to get you familiar with it, is about a, a crow-sized raptor. Um, they have sort of a uniform uh, belly and under the wings with the, the, the black stripes and white belly. Um, they have the, the mustache, which they're known for. Um, and like most raptors, the female is about 25% larger than the male. So here's a female on the top and a, a male below. Um, they're also known for being the fastest animal on the planet. So they hunt um, generally by soaring up high, seeing some prey. Um, they start to dive, they start to flap their wings to get some speed, and then they, they fold in their wings and just become a missile uh, going. They've been clocked at uh, up to 220 miles an hour in a dive. Um, so you don't want to see one of these coming at you. Uh, they're really hard to, to watch in a field. You know, you, you're watching them through your binoculars, all of a sudden they just go, and you can't keep up with them, and all of a sudden you just see a, a poof of feathers. Um, so they're, they feed almost entirely on birds, uh, usually small to medium-sized birds. So right before they hit their prey, they'll um, either come out of their, the, the stoop, which is what the dive is called, and either grab them or sort of punch them and knock them out. <clears throat> so there are currently 19 identified sus subspecies of peregrines around the world. They occur on every continent except Antarctica. Um, here in North America, we have three subspecies. Up in northern Canada, Alaska, and Greenland, we have the Arctic peregrine falcon. Um, along the coast from Washington up through Alaska, we have the Peel's peregrine falcon, and then the rest of the, the continent is the American peregrine falcon, 
And that's what we'll be dealing with mostly tonight. Um, there is a grade between the American and Arctic subspecies where they sort of interbreed. So it's sort of a mixture of the two subspecies. Um, peregrine means wanderer in Latin, and the peregrines are known for their extensive migrations. Um, Arctic peregrine falcons will migrate 8,500 miles from the Arctic down into South America and then return for the breeding season. So they'll travel uh, over 15,000 miles in a year. Now, peregrines were relatively common across the, the continent up into the, the late 1940s, and then they started disappearing. By the 1970s, they disappeared from the east and the Midwest and were essentially um, gone uh, east of the Rockies. Uh, so there had previously been at least 500 pairs breeding. In the West, we had uh, historically at least 1,000 pairs breeding. Um, these declined by 80 to 90 percent during that same period, so from the late 40s to the early 70s. Um, there was also decreases in the, the uh, Arctic peregrine falcons, and both the Arctic and American subspecies were listed as endangered in 1970. Um, the Peel's peregrine falcon, they generally don't migrate, and their populations didn't decline, so they probably weren't encountering um, whatever caused the decline, which uh, turned out to most likely be DDT. So I'll be talking about our work here on the Channel Islands. Um, as most of you know, there are eight islands located off the coast here, uh, the four northern Channel Islands, and then the four southern Channel Islands off LA County. Peregrines were historically on all the islands. Um, there was at least 15 breeding pairs known in any particular year. Um, as you'll see, they're sort of hard to find on a cliff environment. So it was likely quite a few more um, estimates of up to 30 pairs or so. So these all disappeared by the mid 1950s um, and it was blamed on DDT pollution. So DDT was an insecticide developed during World War II used extensively in the Pacific to control mosquitoes. And then after the war, it was brought back uh, to the US and around the world and used extensively for um, controlling insects. Um, uh, during the same period is when the peregrine falcons began to decline. Uh, it affected other species as well. So although it was touted as being the, the best thing since sliced bread, um, it really, it's not good for peregrines, bald eagles, pelicans, uh, many birds high on the food chain. Um, DDE or DDT breaks down into DDE in the environment, and it, which is a very stable chemical, and it impacts how the birds lay down the eggshell. So basically, the chicks would die or the eggs would break before they could hatch. Um, it was discovered that Montrose Chemical Corporation, located in Torrance, California, which was a major manufacturer of DDT, had been discharging uh, DDT-laden sediment through the sewer system at uh, the Palos Verdes Peninsula uh, from 1947 through 71. It's estimated that over 1,800 metric tons of DDT were dumped into the ocean, and at least 500 tons were taken out and dumped at deep water sites. So this was most likely um, the source of the contamination in Southern California. And um, when the declines began in the Peregrines, uh, it started in Southern California and then worked its way north. So the Southern California birds disappeared first. There was a near total ban on DDT in 1972. And after that, other species which had been impacted, such as the brown pelicans, uh, began successfully breeding. And uh, that opened the door for restoring peregrine falcons. So the Santa Cruz Predatory Bird Research Group released 37 peregrines um, on four different islands between 83 and 1998. Um, 17 were released on Catalina and 12 on Miguel and then four on each of Santa Rosa and Santa Cruz Island. The first pair formation occurred on San Miguel Island in 1986. They laid eggs in 87, but they didn't hatch. Um, the first known successful hatch was on Anacapa Island in 1989, 
And the next year on Santa Cruz Island, there was another nest with two chicks. So um, here's sort of a timeline of general surveys of the peregrines early on. Um, Hunt did some surveys in the early 90s as part of a collecting information for a lawsuit against Montrose Chemical for, for dumping all that DDT. And he found eight to nine pairs each year all on the Northern Channel Islands. In 2001, there was a, a lawsuit settlement against Montrose resulting in a, over $140 million in, in penalties and fines. And um, 30 million of that was allocated for restoration work in the Southern California Bight primarily. So the Montrose uh, Restoration Settlements Restoration Program was formed with um, members from basically all the state and federal agencies which had an interest in the area. And they would meet and uh, fund different proposals to do work on well, they funded the, the peregrine work through this year, uh, bald eagle restoration, seabird restoration, habitat restoration, and a variety of other programs. So um, that opened the, paved the way for doing um, some more surveys of peregrines, which hadn't been done since the mid-90s. Uh, Santa Cruz Predatory Bird Research Group in 2007 did a, a complete survey of all the islands and located 27 occupied territories uh, on six of the eight islands. And when I'm talking about occupied territory, I'm going using the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service definition where there's a pair present, either two adults or an adult and sub-adult. And a sub-adult is a, a one-year-old bird. And, or there's evidence of reproduction, so eggs or, or chicks are present. Um, so under the Montrose program, there was supposed to be a survey done every five years for the peregrines. Um, it was delayed for a, a year. So in 2013, um, the group I work for, I, Institute for Wildlife Studies, got the contract to do this, the surveys on all eight islands. Um, we did a lot of hiking. If you've been out to the islands, they can be <laughs> pretty hard to get around. Um, and Santa Cruz particularly, a lot of nice cliff habitat to, to survey. So we did a lot of uh, footwork. We did uh, boat work around Anacapa and Santa Cruz uh, when the water was being nice, <laughs> which most years isn't very often because um, we have a 15-foot zodiac. So <laughs> um, the other thing with peregrines is, uh, well, I'd been working with bald eagles prior to the peregrines. Bald eagles stick out in their environment. Uh, the peregrines, not so much. So uh, when you're surveying for them, you really rely on hearing or seeing them fly. So, you know, there's a peregrine sitting in the middle of that circle there. <laughs> right there. <laughs> Believe it? <laughs> no, that's, a, that's an adult sitting there. So uh, the typical technique for surveying for peregrines was doing a a four-hour observation of a known or suspected territory. So you sit there for four hours and you just scan the cliffs and listen and, and look for, for birds. But if they're not doing anything, you can look right past them. So again, here's another picture. Um, in that square, there are actually two peregrines. <laughs> they're, perched on, they're perched on rocks, but if they just sit there, uh, it's it's near impossible to find them. So that can be a very time-intensive operation to find them. Uh, we decided to use a different technique that was developed by uh, Joe Barnes for his research in Nevada. And this is a um, call broadcast technique. So what we do, we go to a suspected territories, um, sit there for three minutes, just looking and listening around, uh, we then pull out our call broadcaster, and we play back, hopefully, we play back peregrine calls. So we do that for 30 seconds. We then spend a minute listening and looking for any response, play another 30 seconds, and then spend five minutes um, listening and looking. And this is a very effective technique um, for you, usually they'll either vocalize or fly or both. 
Um, for instance, in our first year, we were able to determine birds were occupying a tariff and 58% of the territory is basically within 10 minutes of, of being there. So it was very effective for us. Um, once we found occupied territories, we try to return every 10 to 14 days to see what they're up to, try to locate their eyrie. So here we have a, a female in a potential eyrie. She's in there scraping. Um, they don't build a nest. They just find a ledge or a pothole with some dirt or loose gravel, and they just sort of dig themselves a little depression and, and lay their eggs. So that respect, it's very hard to, <laughs> to find them as well. Um, it'd be a lot nicer if they build a big stick nest like everybody else does. Um, occasionally they will use somebody else's stick nests though. So we do have nests that are in old raven or red tail nests on cliffs. So the typical nesting habitat for peregrines are 100 plus meter cliffs. Uh, this is greeny knife edge. Um, are you familiar with Santa Cruz Island? This is Potato Harbor in the background. Um, this is the eyrie. It's about 50 meters or about 150 feet down the cliffs. Uh, up the top, that's two climbers, just to give you a size perspective. Um, so we found quite a few territories in this sort of habitat, but we also found them in things you would not consider good peregrine habitat, such as maybe 10 to 20 meter tall coastal bluffs, uh, particularly on Santa Rosa Island. So these aren't even rock, they're just dirt with some ledges or potholes in them. And then even on islands that don't have the fox and or skunks or rats, like in Acapa here, uh, they don't care about predators. So this is just on a hillside um, where we can actually just walk down to the top and walk to it, no ropes involved. So um, thankfully they got rid of the, the rats on Anacapa Island. That would have been the only real potential predator for the eggs or chicks. So once we know that there's chicks or suspect there's chicks, because many of these um, nest sites are back in a cave or a pothole that you can't see from anywhere, and we often have to just go on changes in the adult behavior. So if we start seeing them bringing food to the nest, um, then we have a good idea that they're, um, they have some chicks in there. So this is when we start planning our banding trips. We try to ban them when they're usually between 18 and 28 days of age because they develop pretty quickly and after four weeks of age they might have a tendency to, to run off the edge of the, uh, the nest cliff there. And we're not advancing. There we go. So uh, oftentimes you don't know what uh, you're going to encounter when you get there. Um, these are four chicks at the Cathedral Cove, that one that I just showed you that we can walk into. Um, <laughs> and they, they're probably around 18 days of age. So the adults usually aren't very happy with us doing this. Uh, here you can see um, the bird attacking. Um, this is this is Black Point on um, Santa Cruz Island, and this was from 2013. But this year we couldn't even get into the IRA to, to ban the chicks because the female she was she was hitting the climber. She was actually flying in, you know, and, and sitting and standing in front of the chicks with a climber, you know, this far away. So we just we decided for our safety and the chicks' safety that we just skip them for this year. So this is just going to be a, a video showing the, the work that we do uh, at banding time. Uh, we'll go into the IRA, we'll put the chicks into that duffel bag and, and bring them back up to the top of the cliff for um, some safe work up. As I mentioned, males are smaller than females, so you can actually sex them by looking at what band size would fit their legs. So that, that black thing is a, a band gauge, and you just see which one um, fits fits their leg. So I believe this was a male. And now that's the other the other reason we go in at that age is they're they've pretty much grown um, their leg size at that point. So 
the peregrines are so strong that the leg bands have a, a butt edge that fold that you have to fold over to, to lock it on so that they can't take their band off. Yeah, well, sometimes they squawk. Uh, when you get into one of those small caves with three or four of those things yelling at you, you, you need earplugs. <laughs> or when you open up the bag to get them out and they all start squawking at you. And once you get them in, in hand, they are pretty calm. <laughs> There's not much else they can do. At that age, they really don't know how to use their tools too much, but they will, some of the older ones will flop on their back and just put their feet up and start going at you. So the silver band that we put on one leg um, has a, a unique number from the Federal Bird Banding Lab. We also put a black band with silver, with a silver number letter code on it, which can potentially be identified from photos or through a spotting scope um, or through video. So that allows others to identify the birds from a distance um, if they are seen. And then we also take uh, 0.5 cc of blood so that um, right now it's just being banked, but we can do genetics work with it, uh, contaminants work. And if necessary, if we if the, the sex of the bird is questionable, then we can do some DNA just to, to confirm our guess. <laughs> It's a very, very small needle, so from the brachial vein. So if you put your thumb up in the, the armpit, it sort of blocks it off like doing a tourniquet and makes it very easy to do. Um, you would never be able to identify them from a distance with the silver band. Yeah, so the the we get all of our, um, unless they're dead, all of our resightings are from the, the black band with the, the code on them. Um, it's a permanent identification for the bird banding lab. So um, it's a unique number that would never be repeated on any other bird. Um, the, the black bands could have a repeat of code from different regions. They try to avoid that, but it's possible. And then it's time to return the birds and do a little bit of work um, in the nest. So when we took the birds out, we left some stuff on the, the nest ledge just so <laughs> make it a little easier to identify because you could come down, <laughs> could come down and there's all sorts of ledges down there and um, want to make sure you put them back in the same one. Uh, so um, you can see there's a there's an egg that failed to hatch right here. So we collect those so that we can do some contaminants analysis on them. So it goes into a, a clean jar and is wrapped in a chemically clean uh, aluminum foil. You know, we, for the climbing, we use a, um, it's called a gree gree. It's a descender. It's usually made for uh, rock climbing, but it allows you, um, if anyone's ever rappelled, using a figure eight, you have to be holding on to it the whole time. With the gree gree, it's got a lever. You let go of the lever and you stop moving. So that allows you just to hang there relatively comfortably. <laughs> um, it depends on the island. Uh, it's often stakes. Um, if it's a sandy environment, we'll anchor with three or four stakes, basically stacked in a, in a line. If it's rock, we can uh, have an anchoring system for uh, drilling into the rock and putting some uh, removable anchors. Uh, okay, yeah. He was asking what we use for anchors. And then we, so we collected uh, prey remains so that we can have these analyzed by the 
uh, Western Foundation of Vertebrate Zoology to identify what the birds are bringing in. And then we also collect any eggshell that we can find. So sometimes you'll get a large fragment like that, but we also have a sieve that we can uh, sort of go through the, the nesting substrate and find smaller pieces of eggshell. Yes, we, we collect the eggshell to um, measure the thickness and compare it to pre-1947 um, eggshell thickness, pre-BDT. Um, they were. <laughs> You'll see, I'll, I'll present some of that data soon. And then it's time just to return the chicks. So they've been nestled in the, the bag during that portion, clipped to my rope so they can't go anywhere. Uh, they can bite a little bit. That really doesn't hurt. Um, it hurts a little bit more when they get you with their, their talons. Uh, even with the eagles, it depends on the particular bird uh, hooding. Um, so hooding is something that you put over the head, they can't see. Some of the birds, it seems to stress them out more than help. Other birds, it, it essentially fall asleep. And that makes me nervous too, because their head will just sort of fall over. And yeah, it just makes me nervous. So I actually prefer not to have the hood on for the most part. So once the birds are back in the nest, um, they continue to grow and they fledge at about six weeks of age. So take their first flight at about six weeks of age. And we try to get back to the nests around this time so that we can confirm that uh, all the birds have survived to that point. So these guys are just shy of, of fledging. So in our first survey in 2013, we located 45 occupied territories on across all eight islands. 38 of these are on the northern islands. And I think uh, this is largely because of, uh, one, the prey availability up here, a lot more seabirds up on the northern islands. And particularly on uh, Santa Cruz and Anacapa, there's a lot of nice uh, peregrine habitat, lots of cliffs. Uh, we found seven down on the southern islands, um, but these were the first confirmed um, successful breedings on San Nicolas, Catalina, and San Clemente Island. Here you can't even see it underneath the red, but Santa Barbara Island, which is only a square mile, actually has three breeding pairs of peregrines out there. And two of them are within probably a couple hundred yards of each other. They, I, think, I think the birds have probably worked out their territorial boundaries, so they don't tend to, to fight too much. So originally, as I said, this was supposed to be done every five years, um, but because we were also doing the bald eagle project simultaneously, um, the Montrose trustees agreed to allow us to do annual monitoring for the birds. So we've done um, five years of monitoring. Uh, you can see the population has remained relatively stable. Um, so the, these yellow are surveys where there was intensive surveys done. Um, red is just sort of haphazard data that was collected. And you can see there was really no work done between um, the early 90s and 2007, and then nothing from 2007 to 2013. Um, this year, we actually located uh, 52 active territories um, across all the islands. So uh, increased a couple from previous years. Um, some of the data that we've been getting, um, looking at sort of the chronology of, of breeding on the islands, and the red is the period where any particular territory was incubating eggs. Green is when they um, had chicks that they were caring for. Um, so you can see, um, in particular, Signal Peak on Santa Barbara Island tends to have a really early laying. This particular year, they laid in late February, and then down on San Miguel Island, we have one that went as laid, didn't lay eggs until uh, late May. So there's an average of 69 days between the first pairs laying their eggs and the last pairs laying their eggs. And this is one of the longest uh, periods of time or, or breeding season for, for any peregrines. It's probably because of our nice um, weather that we have down here in Southern California. 
Uh, so looking at some of the, the results from the, the eggs that we collected, um, looking at DDE contamination and eggshell thinning. So the DDE is um, measured in the intact eggs that we find, and the thinning is from the eggshell remains that we collect. So back in the early 90s, um, there was a, quite a bit of DDE in the eggs, almost 20 parts per million, so 20 molecules of DDE for a million mo molecules in the egg, and almost 20% thinning of the eggshell compared to uh, pre-1947. The 2007 survey, they found a decreased um, concentration of DDE in the eggs, uh, although only had four eggs versus 16 that, that were analyzed and a, a slight decrease in the, uh, the eggshell thinning, but not equivalent to the amount of decrease in DDE. Not advancing again. I don't know if it locks up or what. I'm scared to hit any other buttons. There we go. Uh, so in our first year, we found that uh, DDE had decreased a little bit more, but we only um, had two eggs to analyze, and there was a further decrease in the, the eggshell thinning. Uh, 2014, there was a further decrease in the DDE. Uh, eggshell thinning went up just a little bit. 2015, we didn't have any eggs to analyze for contaminants, but the, uh, the thinning had decreased even further. And then last year, um, the DDE, was pretty pretty low. Again, only two eggs that we analyzed, but the eggshell thinning had, had nearly doubled compared to 2015. Uh, and it goes from, actually, a negative value means it's thicker than pre-DDT. So it was almost 10% thicker and then 36% thinner. And then this year, um, we haven't had, we actually just got this DDE uh, information last or yesterday, I think. Um, so we haven't had the 2017 done yet, but for some reason the eggshell thinning is up to 30 percent on average, uh, ranging from 20 percent up to 45 percent thinning, and I really can't explain that. Um, I don't think it's probably related to the DDE anymore, but this could be random. Uh, hopefully the next year we'll be able to collect some more eggs and, and see if this trend continues. Um, looking at the, the nesting success of the birds, um, so nest success is the percentage of the bird of occupied territories that successfully um, hatch and fledge at least one chick. Productivity is the uh, average number of chicks produced by occupied territories. And number of fledglings, this is actually just the minimum number of fledglings that we were able to confirm across the islands. So in 2007, nesting success was uh, almost 67% with one and a half chicks produced per nest, and they identified 35 fledglings. 2013, nesting success had dropped a little bit, as did the number of chicks produced per nest, uh, but the total number of fledglings that we identified increased, and that's just because we had quite a few more uh, identified territories. 2014, nest success was quite high, as was the productivity and the number of fledglings. Uh, 2015 was even higher for the, the nesting success. Uh, 2016, we dropped down a bit, uh, both in nest success and productivity. And this year, we had the highest uh, nest success yet and pretty good productivity. So across all of the, the six surveys, um, that were done under the Montrose program. We had about 68% um, of the occupied territories produce a chick successfully. And these numbers are um, about what we see on the mainland of the Pacific uh, coast. Looking at the prey that remains that we collected, um, they identified 74 different bird species in the prey. This uh, does not include this year's uh, prey remains. Uh, the five most common ones, making up between 5 and 8 percent of, of the prey, are the redneck fowl rope, the house finch, 
maybe because they're bright and easy to find. Um, the California gull, which is getting to be a pretty large bird for, for the peregrines to take. Um, Cassin's auklets and the pigeon guillemot. So again, uh, these make up each species makes up five to eight percent of what was found in the prey remains. And I believe that there was a total of about 640 different individuals identified. Um, so this is a, a young peregrine. You can see we've, we've had banded it. So the silver band where you can't read any of the numbers unless you actually have them in hand. And then the, the black and silver band with, uh, so it's 70 over AC. So somebody had taken a picture of this bird. Uh, I believe this was up near San Luis Obispo and reported it to the bird banding lab. And then uh, we got the information. So you can see the young birds, um, the adults have a clean white breast, um, but the young birds have vertical stripes and they're, they're more brown. The adults have horizontal stripes. So this is another bird. This one likes the Sepulveda Dam recreation area down near LA. It's been spotted there multiple times at the dam. So we're starting to get information on the movement of the birds. Uh, the, the yellow lines just show where they were banded and where they were reported from. So you see some movement between islands. Um, the red dots are actually birds that are breeding on the mainland that were banded or breeding that were banded on the island. So one moved from Carrington Point on Santa Rosa Island up near Vandenberg. One moved from San Nicolas Island to San Clemente Island and we located it this year with two chicks in the nest. Um, we get movement down to San Diego, up towards San Luis Obispo. Um, this red arrow is actually a bird that was uh, banded by Jeep Pagel down in the San Diego area, and I saw near two harbors on Catalina Island a couple times this year. So we're getting move. We're starting to get movement information both on and off the islands. So um, conclusions are uh, one: the current population seems to exceed the predicted historic levels. So historically, they estimated maybe there were 30 pairs breeding on the islands. Uh, we're up to 52 this year. Uh, produ productivity and nest success appear sufficient to maintain the population as long as there's good survival. And we don't really have uh, that information yet. Uh, we need to get more banded birds on the island. We, do kn we know there's turnover of individuals and pairs but without knowing identities, we really can't uh, say much about it. And we know there's uh, sufficient habitat out there to support additional territories, uh, particularly on Santa Cruz Island, and probably uh, San Clemente is probably underrepresented. They have some pretty nice cliffs and areas down there. Uh, so questions for future research, if we're able to continue doing this, is, um, just basic population parameters. We need to get more banded birds out there so that we can figure survival rates, uh, emigration and immigration rates we're starting to get from the young banded birds that are showing up on the mainland or back on the islands. Um, and whether DDE or some other factor is still negatively impacting their reproduction, uh, that increasing eggshell thinness is a little concerning and I'm not sure what else besides DDE could be causing that. Um, also this year, uh, we set up a, a live camera on a, a peregrine eyrie on East Anacapa Island. Uh, they have used this nest at least since 2013. And of course, as soon as we put a camera on it, they moved to the back side of the island. <laughs> um, but we've been seeing uh, birds returning to the nest now. Um, playing around, digging a little scrape right here, particularly. Um, so we've got high hopes that this nest will be active in 2018. And this is currently being streamed live uh, through explore.org or um, our website, and probably the, the Park Service's website as well. So we're hoping that this is active in the coming season. If so, I think it would probably be the first completely natural peregrine cam uh, online. Most of them are uh, building ledges and cities or 
a box that has been bolted to a cliff somewhere, uh, this would be the first completely natural uh, peregrine ivy. So before I conclude, just need to thank a wide variety of organizations uh, that have made this project possible. Uh, as I said, the Montrose Settlements Restoration Program has funded the program since uh, 2002. Uh, we work closely with the National Park Service, the Nature Conservancy, the U.S. Navy, and the, the Catalina Island Conservancy for permits and assistance on the islands. Um, Western Foundation of Vertebrate Zoology does the, the eggshell measurements and the prey identification. I um, also need to thank Nancy Wells, who is one of our volunteers that um, has a pair of peregrines that she watches and is able to photograph many days. So a lot of these photos, including this one, are, are ones that she's taken, as is that. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. So yeah, these birds are making a prey exchange. Um, so the, usually the male come back with prey. Uh, flip upside down, or the female will flip side, side down and grab it and then take it back to the nest. So, thank you very much. Do you have any sense of how hard it is for, for the fledgings to learn to hunt? And what's the success rate to move beyond that? Um, we unfortunately don't have a lot of time to watch them post-fledging, um, but they do chase the adults around. With, the adults will fly with food and the young will chase them around and the adults will land and drop it. So I think that helps them, helps the young figure out sort of hunting, but it's, I think it's just a, a instinctual thing to begin hunting on their own. How long do the pairs stay together? Or well, do you know? <laughs> they're supposedly uh, together for life. So that's either until uh, one of them dies. Sometimes they'll just have a, um, another adult will chase out one of the existing pair. So it can be from a couple years to a decade or more. I was interested about the, the, the egg shell. It's getting, according to your graft, it's getting thinner. <laughs> yeah, right. Getting less than it's like pre DDT days. Is that right? It's getting worse. Well, at least what was measured the last two years, they're thinner than any of the other measurements that that have been made. But they're still successful in the nest. I well, mean, still, yeah. No, we don't, we don't know, know. We don't know if those. When we collect the eggshell fragments, we don't know if those are eggs that hatched or eggs that oh. broke in the nest. Uh, perhaps like the first egg is the most contaminated and then because they'll lay up to four eggs or so. So perhaps the first egg that they lay has the highest concentration of DDE, which can make them thinner and then sort of get less contaminated as the clutch uh, is, is laid. Uh, but I really have no explanation for why they seem to be getting thinner the last couple of years. You don't have any thoughts? It, so <laughs> we don't have that pollutant anymore. Well, DDE. D DDE is still out there. It's, out there. Um, it's in the prey. It's in, we know it's in the eggs that have been collected. Uh, it doesn't seem to be at the concentrations that it once was. So I'm not at all sure that that is what's causing these thinner eggshells. It, it could all be random too with Maybe we collected eggshells that had been in the nest for a couple of years and had degraded more. It's it's really hard to say. Uh, there is there is variation between the nest sites and the thickness of the eggs. It doesn't seem to hold to one particular island being more or thinner than others. I think if it is a contaminants issue, then it's probably related. Each pair probably has their own preference for, for food. So, for instance, if they're hitting gulls, um, those tend to be more contaminated than, than the smaller birds because the gulls feed higher up on the food chain in general. Yeah, Peter, how does the uh, contamination relate to the bald eagle uh, uh, when you tested their eggs? Um, the, let's see. 
we had up to 32 parts per million in the bald eagle eggs back in the heyday in the, the late 80s. Uh, it, it had declined since then, so um, I think it's probably pretty similar. We unfortunately, we can't collect the bald eagle eggs anymore because it's all natural reproduction now. And we don't go to ban the eagle chicks till they're eight weeks old. So by that time, usually any egg that's failed to hatch is broken and uh, just got stumped into the nest. So we haven't been able to analyze any bald eagle eggs since I think 2007. So we really don't know what's going on with bald eagle eggs, but for the most part, they're successfully breeding now. So I don't think it's an issue. What age did you say that you banded them at? We banned the peregrines. We we're shooting for three to four weeks of age. Okay. Um, we'll sometimes go as low as 16 days, and we've gone 35 days. Uh, the thing is just once they get past four weeks of age, they um, have a tendency to run and jump. <laughs> so we don't want them to jump off, out of, off their nest ledge. And, and before about 16 or 17 days, you can't uh, determine their sex um, reliably because they haven't grown, their legs haven't grown to the, the full size yet. And how old are they when they fledge? About six weeks, six weeks. 42 days. Thank you. I'm not sure if this was asked already, but how far on average do the fledglings fledge? Like, how far of a territory do they build from themselves? From um, well, we, we're really not seeing, we've only got a few of the birds that have set up their own territory that we know of. So, you know, one went from San Nicolas Island to San Clemente Island, which is probably 50 miles or so. One went from Santa Rosa to Bannonburg, which is probably about 50 miles. So it seems that they're, and these are both males, so I think they, perhaps the males tend to leave more so that they're not interbreeding with, <laughs> with relatives as much. But we've only got two instances so far where birds that we've banded have turned up with territories elsewhere. So the, the, the birds fledge at, at six weeks. At, at what point are they no longer getting uh, prey from their parents? It's probably about a month after that that the uh, they'll head out on their own. With regards to the bald eagles, I seem to recall hearing about um, winter storms in a particularly stormy year kicking up the sediment that has the DDE and redistributing it through the ocean. Is that not something that is happening or um, does anybody know really? I don't think anybody really knows. It's it's pretty deep. It's 200, I think it's 250 plus meters deep. So I don't know what kind of currents or churning you would get at that depth. Um, I suppose the water coming down the LA River could flow out of like Long Beach Harbor, wrap around and and disturb it some more, but uh, I don't think anyone really knows what the what churning might be going on. I mean, that might actually help and bring clean sediment and and stack it on top of the contaminated sediment too. So, so it goes both ways. This question is about money. How long does the uh, Montrose money last, and what do you do when that uh, funding is exhausted? It lasts for another. 50 days or so. <laughs> um, after that, we're we're cutting the project way back for next season. Uh, instead of seven of us, there'll be three of us. We'll cut a couple islands out of the, the surveys. Uh, we're going to try to focus on the islands that have bald eagles, and then we'll do peregrine work on those islands as well. But we're going to key in on the, the bald eagles, because those are sort of the longest running program since it's been going on since 1980. Is there no grant money available? I've applied for a couple grants, haven't heard back. Uh, we do our own fundraising as well, so I've got a, a decent chunk of money because we knew the state's been coming for several years, so I've been 
uh, saving some of our fundraising money for, for a rainy day, which will be coming next year. <laughs> Are any of these birds satellite tagged? No, we we did not satellite tag any of these birds. Um, they do now make satellite tags that are small enough, but they're also about four thousand dollars a piece. Um, so, the information that we would get from them, from the limited number we could put out, just probably wouldn't be worthwhile. It's a lot cheaper to put on the leg bands and have people spot them for you. They do make a, a cheaper um, transmitter that works off cell, cell, cellular systems, but the islands have very poor coverage, so <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't work so well. Have you used drones at all, or are they going to be prey for the falcons? They would, they would probably be taken down pretty quickly by the, the falcons. Uh, the state doesn't even want us to, to do anything with drones around the eagles or the the peregrines. I saw in uh, Australia where an um, eight thousand dollar drone was taken down by an eagle. They've, yeah, the eagles they have there are very drone averse. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more question. I'll also stick around afterwards if you want to come chat. So you were mentioning about people spotting these birds and I guess reporting them somehow to you. And I was just curious how to do that because a few weeks ago I was at Oxnard Beach Park doing yoga and I swear I saw two adolescents running amok out there. They were just trying to get squirrels and then chasing <laughs> after crows. It was like madness was going on. Um, well, if they're identifiable, then you can... Uh you can actually report them online to the bird banding lab. So just Google bird banding lab and there'll be a link where you can put in the date, general location, um, the status of the bird. So if you saw it, then it was alive at release. Or, um, so there's a, a variety of different fields that you fill out. And then usually once every few weeks, they'll send us a report of, of recent sightings. And then I'll you put in your uh, email address, and if I want more information or see if you got photos, then I, I'll email. Okay. You mentioned that the grant money was no longer, uh, well, that the Montrose money was no longer available, and right. grant money is still up in the air. Right. Is there any way for regular average Joes to donate? Uh, you could definitely donate to the Institute for Wildlife Studies on our website. We have a link. Um, so you can donate online or there's an address if you want to send a check to me. Okay, so <laughs> just go to the website? Yes. Okay. Uh, IWS.org. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> how, I'm interested. How do you determine the age of these fledgings? I mean, is it by when? I don't understand how you know how old they are when you... So you can determine the age of the, the chicks in the nest um, by a variety of measurements and phase of development. So we actually have a, a picture <laughs> book, and you can say, okay, this start, these feathers start emerging at 16 days, or um, these their tail feathers emerge at two millimeters per day after age 13 days. So you can age them that way. Um, so we're just we're usually going by. Hopefully we can see them and get a, a good visual estimation of age. If they're back in a cave where we never see them, then you're just sort of guessing that maybe halfway between your previous two surveys is when they hatch. So say, oh, you know, if, if the adults stay off of out of the nest for an hour or so, then uh, the chicks are likely over 10 days old because at that point they can thermoregulate. Uh, younger chicks have to be kept warm. So if both adults are off perched on a cliff, um, you can say, well, they're at least 10 days, so let's give them another seven or eight days, and then we'll, we'll see what we have. Some guesswork. A lot of guesswork goes into it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter, for your presentation. Thank you for everyone being here tonight. We will see you 
for our next presentation on December 14th. Have a safe drive home.